nice to see you again one more time. I remember you all from our first meeting and discussion. So thanks for coming and for, for listening. Actually, I would like to have more, you know, um, interactive uh, lecture uh, that you uh, would be active and asking and commenting, you know, like a discussion. But once we need to have sort of official, you know, lecture, let's say by filming, you know, I am not very good, you know, I am not a TV star, you know, uh, in, in front of cameras. And actually, uh, you know, it's not my business, but if you need this, no problem, it's okay. So maybe at first, I would like to present my topic, just, you know, like normal lecture, okay? Uh, the basic points, the major points in this topic about European identity formation. It's my topic, it comes from my PhD studies, you know, from my dissertation. Uh, actually, this topic is under the, the development. It's not done, it's not finished, you know. Uh, European identity is still ongoing phenomenon. So, at first, maybe I will provide some, um, let's say, objective tendencies, you know, what I know. And then I would prefer to turn to you and to your comments, your questions, to have a discussion, not just one ahead speaking. Okay, people, so let's start about European identity, from where it comes or what are the origins of the topic at all, you know, itself. Um, and what we can say? We can say that if we start with European integration, uh, we did not or do not see the European identity problem at all. There is no any problem related to the European identity. Now you have heard this term, right, European identity, that we need it, that maybe this is something European Union lacks, that it doesn't exist or exist in very limited sphere, in limited terms. So all these speeches, all these talks is just recent, actually. Recent, no more than you know, 30 or let's say 40 years. In the beginning, starting from the beginning of European uh, integration, never thought about European identity as a problem. It was not the issue at stake, you know, in any sense. But we had, for example, in interwar period, pan-Europeanism movement, right? We had it. It was intellectual movement with the idea of pan-Europe, you know, pan-Europe. It means Europe united, you know. It is pan-Slavism and Russia, for example, might be prescribed to uh, like the advocate, being an advocate of pan-Slavism. So this word pan means, you know, general, universal, you know, that Russia as the promoter of pan-Slavism means that uh, Russia takes responsibility, you know, to carry on the uh, all Slavs, you know, all Slavs nations, all languages of the states, uh, you know, not under its control, but just to promote Slavism, you know. Or let's say pan-Americanism. We can say that Hollywood promotes pan-Americanism, American uh, way of life, you know, the values, the understanding. So. Pan-Europeanism was idea of intellectuals in uh, interwar period. Interwar period, of course, it is the period after First World War and before Second World War, right? in this gap, first and the second. And, but these ideas just were intellectual ideas, you know, hopes for United Europe. If we trace back, the idea of United Europe, we can even see 19th century and Victor Hugo speaking in uh, Paris Peace Congress. I don't remember exact year, but in the middle of the 19th century, it, it can be uh, 1850s or 1860s. And he is speaking that uh, I hope I will wake up in the future one morning and I will not see, you know, the Italian parliament, French parliament, but United European parliament. You know, kind of unity of Europe was envisaged, you know. So, but these are just ideas. And when it comes to European integration, uh, European integration started, of course, you know, uh, the reasons why. And basically, it, it were two reasons. 
it, it was the security reason, you know, to create a framework that the Third World War would never come. Yeah. To create institutional, economical, even political framework uh, within which uh, the war would never come again, never came out. So, and the second, of course, the economical development, uh, restoration of Europe after devastating uh, Second World War. So these two reasons, you know, one shot, two rabbits, let's say, you know, by one shot. Um, so, uh, and of course, you know, uh, this uh, wouldn't be uh, a real idea without a certain sense of unity, of course. European integration, the creation of common market would never start without at least minimal sense of unity. And this unity, I guess, we can say it from, from the sources, we know that this unity was uh, arriving from exactly these intellectual ideas about common European culture, common European civilization, you know, from the past. European nations inherit, inherited, you know, some uh, civilizational uh, values which they share, maybe unequally, you know, maybe in one country, for example, British parliamentarism, of course, is much more richer, you know, than, I don't know, Bulgarian, let's say, uh, parliamentarist, um, let's say, a tradition. Of course, it is richer, you know, older, right? It is uh, more developed, but still, Parliamentarism is, you know, universal value around all European nations, okay? Let's see, like the example. So, a certain notion of cultural European common heritage, and this is the conception will be useful, will be applied within European integration in cultural politics. Common European cultural heritage. So, united Europe idea and common European cultural heritage, these two ideas are actually going together and uh, they were the, let's say, ideological basis for uh, common integration to be launched, to start. Okay. So in the 50s, when the integration was launched, um, it was not any concern, as I said, about European identity. It was just the, like this common cultural idea but what happened next? Uh, uh, when European integration was successful, and it was very successful in economical terms, for you know, more than a decade of years, I mean since early 50s till first huge economical crisis in the 1974. In the 1973, 1974, it was uh, global oil prices shock. Arab uh, countries, OPEC uh, countries, uh, oil exporting countries, they decided to punish uh, all the countries, including the European countries, uh, which supported Israel in the war between Israel, then time war between Israel and, and, uh, and Arabs. And uh, this uh, resulted in huge damage, economical damage uh, European countries experienced. And then started another story. When big troubles came, uh, everybody understood that common market uh, is not uh, the solution, is not the vehicle for uh, United Europe. So we can think like a stages, early 50s, the first stage, early 50s, the European you know, integration start, Paris Treaty or Schuman Plan 1950, or European Coal and Steel mm, uh, Community, or the first treaty, 1951, and the second, European Economical Community, 1957. In the 50s, it was established free communities, plus Euro Atom, right, on the nuclear energy. So free communities we have created in the 50s. So starting from these, ending with, uh, 70s, so more than 20 years, European integration showed huge economical advantage. Economical growth was like economic 
know, a boom. Do you know what is boom in economics? It's very fast for development, macroeconomical mm, development. Uh, so uh, when it, it, in this stage, no talks about Europe, Euro, European identity at all. And actually we have uh, the first official document on European identity just in the 70s, 1973, I guess, uh, or maybe 1974, you know, we need to make a Google inquiry, but just in, in, in this year, we have a Copenhagen Declaration on European Identity. And if you read it, this three pages document, and it's a declaration. And uh, what is the essence, what is the problem here? You know, what, what is the issue within this declaration? No problem at all. Uh, all these countries, then time, I don't remember, six or already with uh, United Kingdom, Ireland included, they declare to the rest of the world the reasons or the basis for United Europe. European identity is the basis, you know, we are pursuing. But this uh, declaration is devoted not to the Europeans, it's devoted to the rest of the world. Just to declare who we are, you know, that let's cooperate, you know, let's uh, have uh, uh, international trade, but uh, we are those countries, United Europe, let's say, uh, based on the European identity. And this European identity is uh, named normally, usually, with references to, you know, democracy, human rights, uh, antiquity, you know, social solidarity, and that's it. So, no problem at all. It is for the rest of the world, not for the Europeans. But when the problem, first big problems came, I mean economical problems, troubles, um, each member state started to do own business, to care about own economics, about own market, not about common market. Since you know that European integration has the major task, common market, right? To create common market, then single market or domestic market, but no matter uh, on the details of these terms, but the idea is to create common market for the trade, that no inner obstacles would be active, you know, to demolish and to destroy all the uh, national uh, specificities, uh, uh, barriers on trade. So, uh, in the 70s, when big troubles came, every state became to act selfish, to protect own market, and forgot common market. And from these times, a new term is coming, eurosclerosis. Do you know, eurosclerosis means, as in individual sclerosis, do not remember, right? Don't remember. Not remembering, uh, uh, you have problems with memory. So, eurosclerosis. And exactly, eurosclerosis helped first time to state European identity as a cultural problem. It's not political problem yet in the 70s, right? We are talking about this period, 70s. But it's already became or becoming, you know, at the time, a cultural problem. And you know, maybe you have heard very famous uh, slogan from that times. It was uh, said by Jacques Delors, uh, former then time commissioner of European Commission, no, chief of the, Euro, uh, of the European um, um, Commission, and he said, you cannot fall in love with free market, you need something else. So, you cannot fall in love with common market, right? We cannot create Europeans, we cannot create sense of unity, identity of Europeans, based on solely on common market. We need something more. What more? What kind of this more? The answer? Culture. We need European culture more visible in the European hearts. We need to create sense of belonging. You know, that the Europeans would feel the sense of belonging to the common cultural sphere. So, first time cultural politics were initiated by the Euro European um, Commission. 
and two committees from that time are very important. That is Leo Tindemans committee, report, committee, then report, and according to this report, certain political initiatives started. So 1975, and 10 years later, Pietro Adonino, Italian uh, a politician, uh, committee and report, a people's Europe. If you put on the Google a people's Europe, you will get all these report, you know, all, the, all this report they created. So what they, uh, what they proposed, they proposed uh, more culture into the European integration, European common culture. It means symbolism. Then they created, uh, actually not created, but took from European Council the flag and stated that this flag would be entire European uh, community, let's say Union flag. So what we know as the European Union flag, you know, this blue flag with yellow stars, right? This flag became exactly as the consequence from the cultural politics became European Union's flag from these times, from these committees' initiatives. So flag, anthem, do you know anthem? Hymn, right? Anthem, uh, Erasmus program, you know, exchange students, exchange program started exactly as the result of these proposals. Uh, then many initiatives around uh, culture, for example, uh, European um, cultural capital, no, two cities uh, chosen in this year, in next year, no, in each year, two European cities become uh, the capital of European culture. Uh, many others, stamps were issued, you know, postal stamps with European integration as a symbol, as a, as a un united entity, you know. Uh, entire calendar, uh, European Women of the Year, European Sport, uh, um, um, sport um, um, uh, Collective Team, Sport Team of the Year, European uh, uh, Festivals, you know, European, European, European. Uh, it was always strange for to me uh, to see European sausage in Lithuanian uh, shopping centers. It was even European beer. It's, it's not related to this European cultural politics. But uh, I, I wanted you to give the example, you know, from business. Business also took this idea, you know, uh, that European, European matches, you know, matches. Also, you know, we have in Lithuania. So Euro, 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 Euro. This uh, Euro came everywhere. So. Uh, actually, all these practical business examples, of course, are coming from our days, you know, 20 years old, but uh, European cultural politics is coming from 70s, 80s, right? 70s, 80s. They wanted to bring European cultural idea, symbolism. But of course, this approach was top bottom, right? It's, it, it was not coming um, from the people. It was not grassroots movements. It was artificial, political, bureaucratic, well-financed approach to European culture. It's very typical to everything, almost everything European uh, institutions do, actually. It's top, bottom direction, not bottom, top, top. So, uh, but still, nobody worried, nobody worried. Uh, people lived, you know, French in France, you know, Lithuanians, of course, we were in Soviet Union, so another story, but all these member states, for example, the, these cultural politics actually did not touch, you know, the reality of daily life, let's say. And this uh, has changed a little bit in the Maastricht Treaty in the Maastricht Treaty, 1993, 92 signed, 93 ratified, and ratification process of Maastricht Treaty, ratification, it's a process, proved first time in European integration that the people started to take care on European matters, and they said no. So, mm, uh, until Maastricht Treaty, no 
people, no demos, was invited even to create Common Europe. It was completely elitist project. And this is not the interpretation of mine. No, this is normal fact. Okay? It, is an elit it was elitist project without any involvement of the masses of the people. People lived their own life. European integration was very limited. It was not important. It, was, it, it didn't touch their life, as I said. When in elitist circles, you know, these institutions evolved in the elitist manner. But Maastricht Treaty, first time, coincided this. People entered the stage, not the stage, climbed the stage and said, no, we don't understand this anymore. And this was a shock for European elites. This was a shock. Nobody understood why. Because look, uh, 92 is already 40 years past, without any war, without quite well economical growth, you know, quite good. Why people are not happy, you know, with all this cultural politics, with all investments in, you know, young people, exchange programs. I didn't mention, but uh, Tindemans committee uh, proposed the acknowledgement of the same driver license, for example, you know. If you have driver license in Poland, you can easily go with your car, you know, drive your car in France without any problems. The license would be good or the same, applicable. So all these initiatives, practical, Schengen zone, right? Very comfortable move, movement, uh, crossing borders. So many, many beneficiaries, economical, practical beneficiaries. And still people showed, let's say, not love, you know? People do not love what European elites proposing at Maastricht Treaty. And uh, how these, uh, not hate, but not loving, how this no of the people reflected or appeared by the ratification process, as I said. In, uh, in, uh, in, in Denmark, a referendum uh, uh, voted against Maastricht Treaty. In France, uh, they voted just slightly, just thin yes, just in two, three persons, you know. In many other countries, uh, in public debates, you know, it was obvious that politicization of Maastricht Treaty become, became very severe, very important. So, in academic literature, it is a term. The permissive consensus was broken. So, with Maastricht Treaty, permissive consensus has ended. What is permissive consensus? Permissive consensus since 50s up to early 90s, up to Maastricht Treaty, meant that the people did not actively participate in the European matters, as I said already, right? Did not participate, but they let it. They did not object it. They let their national elites to develop European matters, institutions, you know, dialogues, create some common markets, you know, issues, etc. They let, even though they did not involve them, themselves into that. So this consensus lasted for 40 years. But first time in the Maastricht Treaty ratification process, European elites understood that it is no valid anymore. Okay? It was troubled. People entered the political stage and said, no, no, we, we do not understand any more this and we do not like it. So Maastricht Treaty in academical literature is pointed as the cornerstone for European identity to become first time political problem. So we have relative three stages. I resume now, okay? I make a conclusion first that in the first period, since the beginning, since the early 50s, up to first economical crisis in early 70s, regarding global oil prices shock, in this successive period, European identity was not a problem at all, was not at an issue at all. Nobody cared what is European identity, what should be European identity, what might be the effect of European identity, whatever, no worries at all. Then second period, starting from this global economic crisis since 70s up to Maastricht Treaty for 20 years, 
European identity was somehow related with culture, right? With European cultural politics. They started cultural politics. No? They uh, brought European symbolism in the, in the European integration, you know? Uh, including uh, your program of Erasmus exchange. I uh, actually advise you to use it because I used lots of time, more than 20 times, probably 25 or even you know, around this, I use this program, I love it. But we will talk about you know, this later, uh, whether Erasmus program creates sense of European identity, a little bit later. So uh, this second period, cultural politics, you know, also it was bureaucratic approach, top bottom approach, right? So it did not touch the hearts of the people, you know. People didn't see anything. And permissive uh, consensus lasted. But Maastricht Treaty in the early 90s finally uh, breaks this silent permissive consensus and brings European identity as the political issue. And if you see, for example, political congress, you know, political uh, sciences uh, conferences, no one conference in the 90s, even in the first decade of the 21st century, went without the section of European identity. Each political sciences congress, sociological sciences congress, had this section on European identity. Therefore, I chose this topic. I chose this topic at a time I entered my PhD 2005, probably, and I chose this topic. I saw it's it very interesting. So, uh, what went on later on? So, this was the first time when uh, politicians understood European identity as the big problem, political problem. Without solving it, European integration could not proceed. Yeah? We need European identity because another term, a permissive consensus, plus another term, democratic deficit came as the political issue at that time after Maastricht. It is closely, directly related with permissive consensus, the broke of permissive consensus, the breach, and the European identity. These three conceptions go, uh, go together. So democratic deficit was understood as the real, real, not theoretical, a real political problem. That European institutions uh, do not correspond to the people's will. They do not represent the people. Even though European Parliament was working uh, and was elected directly since when? Do you remember? When was the first election, popular election, direct election to the European Parliament? No idea? 1979. Okay, so 13, 14 years already parliament was elected directly until Maastricht. But it was not a solution. Everybody understood that uh, this is uh, like the artificial involvement of people, you know. Many problems uh, associated with European parliament as the democratic institution. I don't have time to elaborate it, but if you, if you like, I, I could later on tell you what, what are the problems uh, with democracy regarding the European Parliament. It's, it's not the real Parliament, actually. And uh, it cannot bring demo more democracy in the European integration system. So, uh, what was the solution? No solution. It was stated question that we need European identity, a sense of belonging to the same political community. And democratic deficit, the essence of democratic deficit is that uh, the in political institution must represent the people's will, general will by Jacques Jean Rousseau. Do you remember Jean Jacques Rousseau, right? General will, okay? Uh, so, there is no such representation mechanism in the European Union. The most important institution with highest authority is European Council. But this European Council is not elected by the people. It resembles just member states, the governments, right, the leaders, the political leaders of the member states. 
Next, the European Commission is, acts like government, right? So in the national framework, the democratic mechanism is like what? That the people, right? They vote for the parties. These parties who win forming government, government implementing real politics, which touch the life of people, right? We, we, which uh, reflect the needs of the people, right? And then the people, if they do not like these politics, they can vote for another party, and this victorious party would change the government, right? In European Union, there is no such a mechanism at all. European Council doesn't form politics, you know, doesn't form European Commission, you know, directly. It's not elected, one problem. Next, it, it doesn't form it. Actually, it, it, is, it is formed by member states. You can say that uh, European Council. Formally, European um, Commission uh, is appointed by the, uh, by the European Parliament. But the European Parliament is not forming the policies of European, uh, of European uh, Commission as the normal Parliament does, right? Polish Parliament is responsible for creating government, right? And uh, the government uh, implements politics which was, were proposed by the party who was elected a, as a victorious, right? So it is the link in European Union framework, institutional framework. There is no such a link. Because European Parliament doesn't form the government, the European Law Commission, doesn't form. European um, Commission has own agenda, own agenda. So, um, uh, so this democratic uh, deficiencies was first time understood as the big political problem. First time after Maastricht. And European identity was understood, considered as the possible solution. Because as in national framework, you know, the nation or the people has common sense of fate common sense of origin, common sense of belonging uh, to the same culture, then we need, thinking what's going on, then we need this similar on the European level, that we need European identity, which would be basis for legitimacy of the European politics. That is the logic, why European identity is needed. So we see during this short uh, course or history of European integration regarding the identity issue, as I, you just presented, we see that uh, this cultural idea of European identity doesn't help, right? This intellectual, cultural uh, idea on common European cultural heritage doesn't help what the European Union needs. European U Union needs not just cultural, intellectual idea, that we are coming from the same historical, civilizational roads, lines, traditions, like uh, ancient Greek rationality or philosophy, like uh, ancient Greek with democracy, you know, polis, right? Polis, do you know polis, Greek, ancient Greek polis? Uh, like, for example, Roman law, right? The next law tradition. Next would be Christian solidarity, selfish love, uh, Renaissance humanism later on you know, uh, human rights later on. So all these traditions are clearly and well known. But these are not helping. These are not helping because European Union developed in political institutional framework, which needs common political identity, which would ground these institutions. And we lack it. We don't have it. Okay? And what next? Uh, by the way, the next thinking about European identity is an empirical one. How people really identify with what? With Europe, with nation, with what, right? And this empirical evidence very well, again, proved that Europeans never were Europeans. Okay, uh, the Eurobarometer, 
Have you heard about Eurobarometer? What is Eurobarometer? It's a sociological institution. It is the research institution funded and belonging to European Commission. And it was established in early 80s. And since then, it's for 50 years already, right? They are exploring, they are committing uh, sociological um, uh, surveys, asking people what they think. Do you know sociological surveys? How many of you would vote for Pravo i Spravedlivoj? How many of you would vote for PO, right? So sociological surveys. So they started to ask about European identity and they had quadro question system. To whom you or to what you are identifying the most? And the answer was uh, nation, only nation, uh, nation, then Europe, the second one, then um, only Europe, and the fourth local, I guess. So from these four, always, for entire history of U Eurobarometer, from sociological surveys, the evidence comes that the majority of the, of the member state societies still identify with the, surprise, national identity. National identity rules. And it goes from 60 to 80 persons. So it's absolute majority. No. Do you know how much percentage uh, uh, comes from identity with only Europe? Let's guess. Make a guess. How many persons? Identify how many people, I mean, in Italy, in Poland, in Hungary, in United Kingdom, then time the member of the EU, in Germany, in France, in the Netherlands. How many people identify themselves, looking historically from the 80s up to, you know, our days? How many, how, what percentage? With only Europe. Exclusively with Europe. Just make a guess. Stanislav. 60? But it cannot be mathe mathematically. If 60 or even 80 persons identify with national, you know, history identity, so what it is left? It is left, it cannot be 50 or 60, right? Because it would be already 120, so it's impossible. You need to fit to 100 person, right? Scale. Two free persons. Two free persons identified themselves with uh, only Europe. Only European. And of course, they include probably, probably, uh, most likely, they include those people who are directly related, their lives are directly related with Brussels life, right? With salaries, with um, family life, with the um, vocation time, you know, with everyday life. The bureaucrats, technocrats, etc. They express um, European identity. So it is a failure. It's a failure, actually. After, you know, such decades of attempts to create European identity through cultural politics, right? Through massive uh, finances in, in the communication, in public sphere, to create European public sphere. If you, you know, check, for example, databases, scientific databases, put the keywords, European identity, you would see a massive, a bulk of literature in the 90s, in the first decade of uh, 21st century, massive books were financed, uh, written about how we may expect European identity would come, would emerge. And my dissertation is one of this part of this bulk of, of massive literature. So uh, after all these attempts, um, no results, no results. European identity did not rise. By the way, what was expected? I don't know, uh, what, what's your knowledge about European integration history, you know, or theories? Uh, have you heard about European integration theories, for example? There are two basic theories which governed the field for entire 50 years, and still they are valid. 
two basic European integration theories. First is neo-functionalism. Neo-functionalism, Ernst Haas, German origin uh, American political scientist, wrote a book in uh, 1958, United Europe, and presented, you know, the vision of neo-functionalism. Uh, what we expect to be in the future, uh, how European integration would evolve. So they fought, they proposed spillover conception, spillover. It means the cooperation in one field would inevitably lead the states, member states, in the cooperation to another field. From this another field, they would find themselves like in threat to cooperate in the threat field, in the fourth. So, you know, the close, 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 this ring would close, would, would make uh, closer and closer all these member states, you know? Neo-functionalism logic. Cooperation in one field, would inevitably push into the cooperation in another field. And so, in the future, the states would cooperate more, more and more, closer, closer and closer. By the way, do you know that famous thesis from uh, 1951, the Treaty of European Coal and Steel Community, to create an ever closer union of, by the people, of the people. Okay. An ever closer union of the people. This was the task by common market, of course, through common market, but the ever closer union. So neo-functionalism envisaged this path, this course, right? And they were right. They were right. Basically, they were right. What we saw in European integration, it was exactly this logic. Cooperation expanded, 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 and it is still expanding. Uh, it is not your class, but I, I was teaching already to LM, me, uh, LMM uh, program uh, uh, post-diploma studies, you know, like master studies, uh, students. Uh, and the basic issue we have discussed was how European um, uh, legal principle became valid, became legal. What principle? Of auto European autonomous legal order. Do you understand the message? Autonomous. It's not British, German, French, Polish, but it's autonomous. It's a supremacy principle of law, of European law. How it evolved? And the answer is uh, it evolved not by the treaties. It evolved by neo-functionalism logic. It evolved, it was created by the European Court of Justice. By implied powers doctrine. You know, implied. Do you understand implied? It's not written. It, it's not expressus verbis, but it's implied. It's standing on the treaty, looking to the task, to create the task. So this task implies to us the power to implement this task. Do you understand the logic? Implied power doctrine. So European Court of Justice created this supremacy principle of the European Union law over the national law. So this evolved during the 70s, the 80s, and still evolving. And this is a problematic aspect, one of the most problematic aspects, whether European Union law has autonomous legal order. Big question. And I presented some cases, very fundamental cases, for, um, and for example, German, um, German Federal Constitutional Court, the highest court in Germany, objected to it. Objected. Brunner case. It is famous in the title of Brunner case. If you like to make your own inquiries after this lecture, uh, you may, uh, you know, check Brunner case, 1994. Very famous case. Very interesting and very valid how to see important case. So uh, German court, the highest court, no higher court in Germany, this is the highest court, explored the question whether Maastricht Treaty is not violating Germany constitution. And his, it solved the problem wisely, how to say, because the judges perfectly understood that if the answer would be no, or sorry, yes, it violates German constitution. 
then it would mean the end of European integration. Do you understand the danger, the risk of saying yes, of the answer, yes, it does violate Germany's constitution. So no one could expect such proclamation, you know, such, such a decision. So it didn't say it. It said, uh, no, it doesn't violate. Maastricht Treaty doesn't violate Germany's constitution, but we, the court, felt a need to consider the issue, the legitimacy issue of the, this autonomous legal order, of this supremacy principle of the EU law. And it considered in a very specific way. In short version, if you ask me, I, I can, and if you have time, more uh, short uh, sentences on this issue. The court said, since European communities, European Union, Union lacks European demos, European political community, there is no European political community. People, come on, there is no. It's obvious. They said, of course, in, in diplomatic language, in legal language, not like me now, but the essence like this, the message is like this. There is no European community. What ultimate authority comes from then? Do you understand the problem? I think uh, for a Professor uh, uh, Philip, you have the classes on uh, philosophy of politics or legal philosophy. I am not sure, so please for correct me. So the authority, the ultimate, the highest authority always in political theory was uh, conceived as the people, general will, as the nation, since antiquity. Of course, we have different topic. What is a nation as a conception in modern times? What is a nation in antiquity? It's a different topic. But the idea is the same, that nation has the ultimate authority and the legitimacy of political institutions come from the nation. So Brunner Court asked, where is the nation? Where is the European nation? There is no such a, such a reality. Therefore, what is the consequences then? What legitimacy, ultimate uh, highest legitimacy does come from? And it comes, you know, from the national level where we have the demos, where we have the political community from Germany, from France, from Italy, whatever. So it rearranged, Brunner Court rearranged this, this pretension of, by European Court of Justice to impose the supremacy rule, said, no, since you lack ultimate legitimacy, we remain the power to review your decision in the future. You don't have ultimate power. We have ultimate authority. Therefore, we are in charge to review you whether your decision wouldn't violate in the future our constitution and human rights. Very similar um, decisions were made by other member states' courts, by Italy, Italian uh, Constitutional Court. Very similar. So member states' constitutional courts remained, they wanted to remain, to keep the highest ultimate decision power over European Court of Justice. And the reasoning was based on the, on the identity, on the, on the highest authority question. Um, so, and by the way, uh, uh, this legal uh, overview, I can finish with, with such sentences like, uh, this European Court of Justice attempts to create autonomous legal order or the supremacy principle of the EU law over the nation states law, it was not like normal. It was not like, you know, everybody expected, everybody knew it, everybody were happy with it. No, it was called, in, at least in the scientific literature, especially if, uh, by the famous American constitutionalist, uh, Joseph H.H. H. Weyler, 
very good name and very notable name, uh, he said he called it a silent revolution. European Court of Justice created, performed silent revolution. It brought into the European Union framework constitutionality. It created constitutional order. And it is not, uh, how to say, normal, usual, expected thing. No. But by neo-functionalism, it was expected. And do you remember, I told you, neo-functionalism, right? As the, uh, as the um, main theory which presumed closer and closer cooperation. And actually, neo-functionalism as a scientific theory was blamed for being too close to the political notion of federation. Are you scientists or are you already politicians when you're talking about closer, closer, closer union? So the end is similar. The federation is the political conception, right? Neo-functionalism is purely scientific conception, but both of them have the same result, federation, ever closer union. So neo-functionalists were blamed that they are easily, too easy, passing the scientific lines and going to the political field, you know? They're speaking like the politicians that to create a federation. So it was, by then it was expected. So uh, the closer, closer and uh, autonomous order of European level, European institutions. But it was the another theory, counter theory of European integration, it was and still is called uh, intergovernmentalism. And the notion itself refers to what? To governance, right? Intergovernance. And the best or the, the most uh, simply, simplest way to understand it, Charles de Gaulle, the Europe of the nation states. Charles de Gaulle vision, legendary French uh, president, general and then president, right? By the way, in Warsaw, you have a beautiful sculpture, right, where palm, palm is growing. And by the way, is it an artificial palm or real palm installed? Artificial. Oh, my God. Fictionary. <laughs> because, you know, in such north territories, right, to palm is, doesn't grow, right? So palm circle and then Charles de Gaulle statue, right, stands. So you pay respect for him. So he expressed and defended for entire his life, up to his life, the vision of uh, Europe of the nation states, not Europe as the federation, or the Europe of the nation states. That is intergovernmentalism. And these theories go like, you know, wave after wave. When everything is good in economical terms, in, in, you know, in, in political terms, no big problems, then neo-functionalism grows up, you know? grows up and says, yes, now we are ruling, it's everything like we are saying. But when troubles are coming, then intergovernmentalism appears and says, look what we have said. Who holds the keys? That is the intergovernmentalism question. Who ultimately, finally holds the keys? And the answer is member states. By all the definitions, legal definitions, by the treaties, by, but not by the uh, vision of the European Court of Justice, right? Do you understand? European Court of Justice uh, envisaged and implemented a different vision, right? Autonomous European legal order, which is the higher than the member states. So this is pro-federal, of course, approach. Intergovernmentalism is uh, for the member states approach. United Kingdom is uh, pro-neo-functional, pro-federal or pro-intergovernmental. The answer is clear, right? It's pro-intergovernmental stance. And by the way, subsidiarity principle, have you heard about subsidiarity principle? It was also brought by the British. By the British, in, into European legal order, it was brought by the British in the Maastricht Treaty. They understood that this is an attempt, Maastricht Treaty, 1992. It is an attempt to create the, this autonomous European level they feared it and they included subsidiarity principle. And subsidiarity principle, do you know the essence of it or not? Subsidy, that the European institutions may act only as they help, not as their dictator, right? Not as the imposing the will, no. If the local level, or local level here means nation states or member states, 
can do better, European institution must stop. It cannot go further. Okay? Subsidiarity, defending of the competence limits. You know, the drawing the, uh, uh, um, competences limits uh, by the European Commission or by any other European uh, institution. Of course, this principle in strict legal terms is applied only to those competences which are not primary competences. Primary competence means common market. In common market, uh, subsidiarity is not being applied. No, because uh, the member states already gave sovereignty powers to create common market. So subsidiarity applies only in different. Well, for example, in family law, for example, it is subsidiarity is still valid. What is gender, you know, what is education, uh, you know, all these, uh, what insecurity politics, subsidiarity applies. In foreign affairs politics applies. But British, therefore, the exit of United Kingdom was uh, the loss for those states which prefer intergovernmental approach to the European politics. It was a huge loss. We lost a friend. We lost, how to say, big power, big advocate for the limiting this autonomous European order. Do you understand what I'm talking, people? Is it still clear? Okay. So, uh, and I should finish because, uh, because uh, you know, time is time and time has uh, limits. But I should finish like this. Uh, if, we, if we look um, in the recent tendencies, what are the recent tendencies uh, in this field, in this topic, European identity, uh, etc., uh, we see that, uh, let me express myself like this. Not even any lesson was learned by European institutions about these problematic aspects of superiority, you know, of the European level or member states. No one lesson was learned. Even after Brexit, we see just the narrative which is strengthened towards an ever closer union. Okay. During the Brexit, we saw a shocking, I would say, a shocking approach to United Kingdom by European political elites, including our national level elites. Uh, I mean, it was uh, not a hidden disgust. It was not a hidden um, blaming British. It was not hidden or expressively, you know, appearing hate even towards British. It was thinking not how to, it was thought not how to make Brexit more effective, you know, more simpler, but how to punish the United Kingdom. It was not a debate between long-standing colleagues, as it was previous. Before Brexit, the United Kingdom was presented like the our friend, you know, Europe, one of the pillars of the European Union, you know, one of the major countries, what is right. That British also are Europeans, etc., etc. During one night after Brexit happened, during one night, the position has changed completely. 360 degrees, you know, changed, and British never were Europeans. They always were bad Europeans, you know. We need to punish them. Barnier, Barnier the, the, this um, French um, politician who was responsible for Brexit, the highest, you know, the, 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 uh, for the debate, for the uh, making conclusions uh, agreement uh, with British on the Brexit. When he was in, in Vilnius, he openly said it. We need not only leave British alone in mutually beneficial way, but we need to punish him, them. We need to punish them because if we let them normally civilized way, then maybe other countries would think that, you know, it's a normal process. Let's have Frexit, net, net Netherlands exit, you know? No, no, no. We need to show that no one even, no one state even could think about leaving the EU. We need to make a Brexit, you know, in, pun in humiliating way. Barnier was. We were surprised about it. 
We always fought Lithuanians from Eastern Europe, always fought about Europe as the united civilization, right? That it is the safe space, united, common, North Atlantic even common space, including the United States, right? Because we have an interest, the West, to be united against Russia. And we didn't see that these discrepancies within Western world, we didn't see. We just started to realize it, it now. So, uh, why I so um, spent much time to explain Brexit a little bit uh, in, in this uh, fashion? Because uh, Brexit was the best uh, evidence how European level elites, bureaucrats uh, thinking. And these, uh, these uh, symptoms were evident even before Brexit, long time before Brexit. I remember the Treaty of Nice, 2000, right? 2000, yeah, Nice. When Irish voted in the referendum against the Treaty of Nice. Next morning, I remember by my, I remember by my own eyes, uh, I reading the, uh, the uh, article, you know, uh, someone, Brussels bureaucrat is telling, Irish must vote again. They voted not correctly. The result is not we appreciate. So you need vote again the second time. Is this very democratic narrative? Is, is, is it very respectful to people's wish narrative? No, right? No, any. No. It is very, how to say, bureaucratic politically aggressive narrative. So, uh, finally, uh, European identity, still democratic deficit, still is ongoing problem within European Union. It wasn't solved and nobody knows how to solve it because institutional setting of the EU is very different than from the national level. Different. Parliament has different role. United, uh, European Council is different. No one analog is in the national framework, you know. So, uh, democratic deficit still is ongoing problem. Uh, bureaucratical approach to politics, it technocratic approach, it's still ongoing problem. European identity is still uh, non-existent or existing in very, very limited uh, sphere, in limited terms. And what we see in the most recent years, I mean in COVID-19 pandemic, in the changed agenda by the European Commission, with climate change, I mean, do you see the protest in Berlin, in Germany, in, in, in Netherlands? Have you seen this protest? No? Massive protest. Climate change, the politics which affects agriculture. They want to close uh, entire sectors of agriculture. People are protesting in Vilnius. Today, yesterday started, still continuing today, up to Friday. Huge farmers protest. Vilnius center, Lithuanian capital center, is occupied by tractors. Do you know tractor? Huge machines by agriculture. Occupied. Hundreds, maybe thousands, I don't know. Uh, if I were in Lithuania, I, I would participate there. So, uh, everywhere it is, you know, in, in Netherlands, in Berlin, in Germany, thousands of, of tractors are protesting. Tractors, I mean farmers with tractors, of course. In Lithuania also. So, changed agenda by European um, um, uh, Commission towards climate change, towards genderism, coverage into slogan of equal opportunities, fight against discrimination, you know, packed in the, in the vision of human rights, let's say, you know, genderism, new things, never visible, never actual in the history of European integration, never. Even the European Convention on Human Rights doesn't speak about, doesn't mention even about any conception of, of genderism. It talks about human rights. It, it talks about men and women, but not about the plurality of genders, not about sexual orientations, not about the um, 
uh, gender as this sexual identification. It doesn't speak. But analogous court to the European Court of Justice, analogous court, European Court of Human Rights, does pretty much the same silent revolution within human rights system as European Court of Human uh, of, uh, of Justice did in the creating autonomous European legal order. So they do the same thing. By the way, I will teach this exactly this matter on, on, uh, on Saturday and Sunday, and I will cite the case by uh, European Court of Human Rights on Poland. Just recently, just one week ago, they issued the, uh, the decision against Poland. It's very symptomatic. And I will show, I, I will disclose all these tendencies. Look, 2010, so 13, 14 years ago, the same human court, uh, European Court of Human Rights, it's not institution of European Union, right? It's a different. So I am talking about analogos, but it's important to understand the evolvement where global institutions evolving to what direction. So 2010, the same court has issued a decision by which it said that the, um, the issue of uh, homosexual unions, not marriages, but just unions, oh, let's say marriages, this issue belongs solely to the member states, to the national level. We are not even involve, involving ourselves in this discussion. It's not our matter. 13 years ago, right? So 13 years passed. And today, no, in January, 2024 January, just recently, they issued a decision against Poland that Poland even has a duty, not just, you know, uh, how to say, uh, business, but a duty. They are imposing a duty to the nation state to create the legal mechanism which defend which uh, regulate uh, homosexual uh, cohabitation. 13 years and so two very different decisions, right? By the same court, by the same court. 2010, it is left to the nation states because it's not the European human rights system business to issue a decision to take involvement in this. And 2024, it is already obligation. See how autonomous legal order is creating by the is created by the certain institutions, which never we elected. You even do not know the judges, uh, right? Uh, for, uh, or even this court. What what does it mean? This court. So this is the problem. So European identity. My issue. I am giving you the examples, but concluding. So we shouldn't expect European identity to, uh, to arise from grassroots. We shouldn't expect. No one sign is available from that perspective. No one sign shows it. No signs exist. Uh, the newest Euro, Eurobarometer survey is from 2020. I just uh, yesterday searched this and looked showed the same pattern. It means uh, family and nation is two the most uh, um, the references which uh, people identify the most across Europe, with no exception. With no exception. Family and national identity rules here. Yeah. And by the way, uh, they changed uh, the questionnaire system and they soften this, uh, you know, only European, only national, and nation, then Europe. Do you remember these questions in, in the past? Now they changed it in order European and national to be compatible. And still, identity to the national level is much more higher than, than to the European. So uh, what we need to expect? Uh, more centralized global politics at the European level either in human rights system, which is a little bit outside of the EU, or within European Union. Uh, 
this uh, global politics, uh, I would say, is not ready to, not to stop, but even is not ready to learn the lessons. For, for this pattern of politics, uh, even Brexit was just uh, anomaly, you know, anomaly. It was uh, not important and uh, the thing we must forget as soon as possible. Uh, but problems I revealed you, you know, democratic problems, representation problems, identity problems, they go since the beginning, right? The permissive um, uh, consensus. Uh, so all these problems are deep and uh, they are in contrast with centralization of global uh, political will. They, they have conflict here. So it's inevitable to have conflict. It's inevitable to have conflict uh, in our ongoing years. And uh, probably short one sentence, probably the, the solution is to, to find somehow cooperation model, co uh, modus vivendi, to cooperate between national level and the European level. Because you cannot, we cannot say that you know, since it is democratic deficit, since it is uh, rising power of global institutions, then we need to close it at all. No, the states needs common market. The states, member states needs common market. But on the other hand, they need to balance uh, democratic identity issues also. And I wouldn't think that Poland would accept this, uh, this decision by European Court of Human Rights. I wouldn't think. It, would, it, it creates problems, it creates problems, legal problems. And nation state uh, will defend, probably it will defend somehow. As Brunner case showed, Germany, Federal Constitutional Court has defended. So as we see, final sentence, as we see European politics, it is uh, the field where a constant battle is going on between national level and European level in mutually, you know, interchangeable way, you know. It's a battle. We, we shouldn't think about European uh, politics as the finished politics, ended politics, and everything is already decided. No, it's not decided. It's an open-ended political clash or interest. In certain sense, it is normal. It is normal. But in certain sense, uh, it is very, very conflictual. That's it. Thank you, people, for attention. Sorry for going through, through, uh, through time limits. Uh, people, please ask, comment, because your professor needs to take you to another class. Okay. Any ideas? Any? Uh, dear Professor, first of all, uh, thanks for uh, your great lecture. Uh, I have one question about uh, current three uh, attempts of uh, new union crats. Uh, union crats, uh, not euro crats, because from my point of view, uh, European Union uh, is not Europe. Uh, Europe is uh, continent based on uh, Roman law, based on uh, Christianity faith, based on uh, Greek philosophy. And uh, I would like to ask you about uh, attempts of uh, change uh, union treaties, uh, because now uh, we will have uh, this uh, 267 uh, amendment of um, union treaties uh, who postulate uh, common defense policy, I mean uh, defense union, a common uh, union army, uh, also Yes. Also, uh, common European education include uh, gender propaganda in school, 
And uh, I would like to ask you, uh, what do you think uh, did uh, Union Crafts uh, achieve the success? Uh, did uh, European Union make more, more centralized and uh, and it and this is uh, the beginning of uh, the era where when um, the Europe uh, reject uh, national sovereignty or maybe uh, it's beginning uh, a good time for uh, sovereignty movements for a uh, new uh, nationalism or something. Thanks so much. Yeah, but, uh, you know, as we already have told and have discussed, you know, uh, it was always the tendency toward federalization. It was always. It, it is not new. What is new is, of course, the, the extent, the essence, the content, you know, it's new. We never heard about genderism in the European politics before recent, you know, years. We have never heard about the abandonment of veto rights. Veto right is established in, by the Luxembourg Compromise. Uh, I didn't tell because of the limit of time, but Charles de Gaulle uh, recalled out all French representatives from the European institutions in 1965. And this is known as empty chair crisis. Empty chair, nobody sits at the European meeting from France. France withdrew all the representatives. Empty chair crisis. And this empty chair crisis ended with Luxembourg Compromise next year in 1966. And this Luxembourg Compromise established French uh, Charles de Gaulle vision, veto right. When the state sees vital citation, vital national interest, then it may veto this uh, common European initiative. Now, these new proposals, they are seeking to reverse this veto, right? right? So, uh, as I told you, these tendencies are dangerous. I mean, dangerous in what sense? In democratic sense, in subsidiarity sense, in legal sense. They, but we need to understand these two, uh, two, uh, two lines. First is this long time perspective towards federalization. There are big interest groups inside Europe which wants federal Europe. Very strong, big interest groups. They were always there, always. You know, they haven't appeared just recently, no. So this one, and then second, that uh, uh, you cannot have federalization line course towards the federalization without solving a democracy uh, deficit problem. You cannot have. And uh, I don't remember whether I wrote you on the desk, Danny Roderick, uh, by our last meeting. Do you remember? Uh, the paradox of globalization. Danny Roderick. Uh, he finds the same idea as uh, I'm talking right now you, that you cannot have uh, the strong and stronger, close and closer, um, approach to global politics, you know, without solving democracy deficit, legitimacy problem. You will have another, another autocracy then. And then as you envisage, you know, as you, your prophecy goes on, then probably the more you have strengthening global level, the bigger gap of democracy, and then following is the bigger uh, conflict arises and uh, the biggest fear for movements to uh, to uh, come out as the protest against it. Yes, uh, I think you think uh, you think you consider in, in proper lines, but the idea is that nobody knows the outcome. Nobody knows the outcome. Uh, nobody knows the recipe. Uh, we see just conflictual forces are fighting and uh, visions like, let's say, fighting. And uh, if it would be so easy, you know, as British did, you know, let's go out of European Union. But British have own logic. They have commonwealth. They have uh, economic interest assured outside of the EU. We don't have such privilege. I mean, Poland, Lithuania, 
other Central European countries, Hungary, Czechia, you know, uh, we don't have such privilege. So we need common market. But how to balance the need uh, for common market with our national, you know, uh, identity, including, you know, fight against genderism, including these new human rights, this is the task for future uh, politicians. But yes, your, your, you point to the right, right direction. This is our future. What you are talking about, this is our future for the, in the foreseeable years to come. Okay, people, what, what else can I help you by my comments? Uh, well, the nations agreed for what has been written in treaties. And now mm, the rules established by European court are clearly breaking the treaties. And my question is why none of nations is saying that you've just crossed the line and the line is the treaty. And um, I think that the rules should be changed by the changing the treaty and not just establish one, one party of the agreement. But you know, your words are, uh, how to say, are very, you know, the, that the uh, European Court of Justice uh, broke the treaties is very radical conclusion. They, it, this conclusion wouldn't be accepted by the European Court of Justice, right? But it's, and, and by many, many uh, European legal scholars, they wouldn't accept it. They would say that uh, it uh, showed activity by interpreting the treaties. And it created European legal order out of the treaties, not by bro breaking the treaties, but out of the treaties, from the treaties. Okay? But it is the matter of interpretation, of course. It is a matter of interpretation. Uh, for example, Joseph Wheeler said that it is silent revolution, but in positive manner. That, you know, it's, no, they made it, but it's debatable, but basically it's ac acceptable. But another intellectual, by the way, leftist, uh, Perry Anderson, and I give, gave uh, his uh, article uh, in London Book Review, in 2021, so two years ago, I gave this article to the other students by LLM um, program uh, to consider. He calls this what you told even in more radical way. He calls it like a coup. It's not like silent revolution. It's not like, you know, debatable argument. It's a coup. A coup. Do, you, do you understand what is a coup? Coup is, you know, the term comes from military taking power by military force, you know, with automats, you are coming to parliament and taking the power. This is a coup. So he says a coup on the same matter, what the European Court of Justice did. So I provided you, you know, two visions. Uh, you may choose what vision. It's a matter of interpretation. Uh, but what regards your question, you know, the essence of the question, that uh, no matter how we interpret, the problem is, right, what to do with the treaties and what to do with the court's decisions and the political institutions like European Commission activities. You know, they easily cross the borders with genderism. It's obvious that in, uh, in treaties there is no any genderism. Of course, it is included in Lisbon Treaty already. It is included about the uh, human rights uh, in especially added minorities, you know, so presuming uh, also sexual minorities, but it, it is an artificial sentence. It, it has no background in the previous treaties, in no one treaty, you know, mentions, no one treaty mentions such, such issue before Lisbon Treaty. Uh, we missed another thing in our talk, European Constitution, failed European Constitution, 2005, and this Constitution had expresses verbis, the supremacy principle of EU law. It was written that EU law has supremacy over the nation state or member states law. And since this constitution failed by Dutch and French referendums, they rechanged it into Lisbon Treaty. Lisbon Treaty is the same constitution for Europe, but reformed a little bit. But this sentence, they didn't dare, 
didn't dare, you know, to include. So, but they wanted so much this sentence, supremacy principle sentence, that they didn't write expressively in the treaty, but they issued Declaration 17. In this declaration, they state the principle of supremacy referring to European Court of Justice. By the practice case law of European Court of Justice, uh, the European Union law should have supremacy over the member states, something like this. But this is declaration, it is not the treaty. It is follow the treaty, but is not the text of treaty. So see how it's a play, right, at the highest level to include the Christianity to the European Constitution or not include. Do you remember this issue? Big issue, how you cannot include Christianity even in the preamble to mention, right? It was the shock for some Europeans, you know, elites also, and the national elites. So it is always the, the clash, the conflict between the supranational European autonomous or federation level and to the, those who want to defend or to remind the limits of this. Uh, again, so the essence of your question is correct in my view, very correct. Uh, it's, it's a big problem. It is a big problem. And we now are looking at uh, the fight between these two tendencies. You know, European level, autonomous, supranational, and this national resistance. But in my personal view, now we see the victory of, of the European powers, I would say, in this way. Because uh, the narrative is becoming stronger and stronger, you know, towards the uh, supremacy, towards the sovereignty of the European legal order. And, and from the, uh, since British left, uh, no one expressively, publicly, you know, is ready to defend. It seems like this. Of course, it's very primitive, my, uh, uh, these, uh, considerations, but, uh, but uh, British, uh, after British Brexit, you know, they left, we see empty space a little bit for the defending uh, the limits of EU competences. Okay, I've got a question about uh, the uh, topics you've mentioned because uh, we see all these tendencies and my question is what are the solutions to those problems if you gave if you are able to give us at least a draft it will be um, it will be great uh, do we have to concentrate on the culture aspect or do we have to really be based about the power of the governments and of the uh, European structures themselves? Okay, very official question. No, uh, uh, but uh, how I think, you know, first thoughts which come to my head, look, Soviet Union, let's, I do not compare Soviet Union with the EU, but let's take the example of Soviet Union. One of the most brutal systems in human history, one of the most brutal. You could draw the most touches on Stalin's picture in the book, and you and your family for this could be deported to the Siberian lands, you know? So even in the 80s, in the 80s, no one could see the possible symptoms of dissolution of the system. The system seemed so strong, military strong, politically strong, institutionally strong. It was no any symptom that it is something, you know, bad or it, how it may collapse. But people in the 70s, in Budapest in the 50s, Praha Spring in the 60s, Polish in the 70s, 80s. Dissident line, dissident tradition was always existing, was always existing, you know? And no other way to fight to combat those 
political regimes, institutions, you know, which oppresses you. I think in this way. You, you know, it is a little of importance, maybe I'm not right, but it's a little of importance, little, not much of importance, to take, a, to have a protest in Brussels. Thank you. Sometimes, maybe it makes sense, as a farmer, as a Jew, right? French, Belgium, farmers, Dutch farmers go to Brussels. But drawing or getting the lesson from Soviet Union, it is much of sense just to stand, to defend real human rights, to defend democracy, to defend constitutional rights. And these anti-Soviet dissidents were right. Even in the very brutal times, 70s, Brezhnev still rules. They started to do this. Helsinki groups, do you know Helsinki groups? From the 1976. Human rights groups. From the grassroots. They started to organize, you no? Know? And your point is very good. These real human rights activists, real, not today's, but in Soviet time, they were based in culture, in own national culture. Andriy Sakharov, uh, Vladimir Bukovsky, Alexander Stromas, the Lithuanian guy, Vladimir Vysotsky, do you know his songs? Culture played a huge role to the people to defend the sense of freedom. In when the times are very brutal, institutionally, from political regime, the state level, times are, might be very brutal, but the people referring to the culture, referring to the creativity, okay, and referring to the human rights, they were standing on, on this base. They continued and they won. I am not saying that dissidents, anti-Soviet dissidents, uh, defeated Soviet Union, or uh, this was the reason Soviet Union was dissoluted. But they were the first with the hammer to knock on the wall. Do you know Pink Floyd, brick on the, uh, of the wall, right? So they started this openly, you know? And this is powerful tradition. This is very powerful tradition. We still have in Lithuania, for example, we still have those people alive and speaking publicly, who, how to say, who uh, was tortured by the Soviet agencies. And do you know what? They, exactly, these people now criticizing European Union. Which is strange, right? Because anti-Soviet dissidents always were talking about Europe as their salvation, as our course to safety. We wanted to become Europeans. We wanted to get to Europe back as soon as possible. But now they see very strange alien tendencies coming from EU and they object, they reject it. They still standing. It's a very good song, I'm still standing. If you know, it's a popular song. Yeah, right, you know this, yeah. So they still standing. Anti-Soviet dissidents, they are all of age of 80 years old, of course, but they are still standing as the authority in public to defend human rights. It's a paradox. In a free system, in a democratic European system, we need to defend human rights. Do you know Paivi Raisonen case in Finland? She is former minister of Finland government, she is now in the court, sued by prosecution, by citing Bible. Please take your own inquiry on her case. The case is still ongoing. It's not solved yet. Can you imagine in Finland, to cite Bible is an offense, it's a crime. So it's just one example. There are many other examples. So uh, final, focus, you know, final remark is uh, I am answering very materially, very standing on ground, not from academical field. I am answering to you 
uh, what I see by my own eyes. Uh, Anti-Soviet dissidents showed the path. No matter what's going on, on the, in the politics, in the European Court of Justice, in the European Court of Human Rights, no matter. We, you, me, the other, just normal people, as they did in the Soviet times, need to stand for human rights. Need to defend them. And the sister Niyola Sadunite, sister, I mean, a nun, right? A nun. Uh, priest Robertus Grievous, they're still alive, and this uh, priest uh, Kaunatskas, Petkus, they're still, no, uh, they're still uh, fighting for human rights, even in the European Union, in Lithuania, because they see negative tendencies happening. So from all these, you know, your question imposed, you know, these macro tendencies, you know, reference to culture, mac no, not macro, local level, local, even individual level. This is my thoughts. Maybe I am not right, I don't know, but this I, I prefer. Okay, people, thanks. Who else? It's already five after five. Oh, it's okay. If you are, then good. Oh. The lecture was so, uh, so interesting. But may I have my phone? Uh, okay, thank you. So your lecture was was so important and and so uh, so helpful to our students, I think. And uh, you, I suppose, you don't know that, but some of our students is going to uh, is going to have their own students conference at the end of February this year, and the conference um, will be devoted to the uh, Europe uh, to the idea of the Europe of Nations. So I think your your lecture is extremely up to date for uh, for them, and apart from that, uh, is uh, and it might be very useful, and and it will be useful, I hope, for for all our students because they are they are also preparing to the exam exam of the uh, the European law. This semester they have such an exam, so I think. Your uh, your speech, your lecture, your information you have delivered here, I think, um, are and will be still very beneficial for for all of our students. So, Andrius, thank you very much for your for your lecture. Uh, as I said, that was um, uh, extremely interesting, and uh, we stay in touch. I hope you will uh, you will visit us. Uh, in the future as well. So thank you very much I once again. Also. So thank you for accepting me, and uh, I hope that what I have said, you know, what ideas I have presented will be useful somehow, in one way or in the another way, you know? But uh, they are worth to think about, as your questions also uh, show that you are thinking also, you know, the matters we have discussed. So thank you and keep on. <laughs>